Professor Dave and Chegg here. We have learned so many things about the stoichiometry of a reaction, which always stems from the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. But this balanced chemical equation doesn't really tell us what is happening on the molecular level. In order to talk about what individual molecules are doing when they react, we will have to discuss the reaction mechanism, which is the pathway by which a reaction occurs. This may seem a bit abstract, but it's quite important, so let's shrink down to the molecular level and get a closer look. Unbeknownst to the macroscopic observer that cannot see individual molecules, a reaction will often proceed over multiple steps. For example, the decomposition of ozone to become diatomic oxygen can be shown using this overall reaction, but in reality this reaction happens in two steps. First, a molecule of ozone will lose a singular oxygen atom to become diatomic oxygen, and then that lone oxygen atom will react with another molecule of ozone to generate two more molecules of diatomic oxygen. Each of these steps will be referred to as an elementary reaction. These occur exactly as written and cannot be broken down further into simpler steps. These elementary reactions add up to give the overall reaction, which in this case would show two ozone molecules yielding three molecules of diatomic oxygen. Once again, from the overall reaction, we can know all kinds of things about stoichiometry, but to know what is happening every step of the way, we must refer to the reaction mechanism, which is the series of elementary reactions. Looking again at the mechanism, we notice that monoatomic oxygen is present as a product in the first step, and a reactant of the second step, but does not show up in the overall reaction. That means monoatomic oxygen is an intermediate in this reaction. Let's introduce another concept. The number of reactant species involved in each elementary reaction is called the molecularity of the reaction. Let's examine the different degrees of molecularity that are possible. Some reactions do not involve a collision, they simply involve the decomposition of a singular molecule. These are called unimolecular reactions. Here are some examples of these, like the decomposition of ozone and the decomposition of cyclobutane. Energy is required for any reaction to occur, even unimolecular reactions, so even though these do not involve a collision between two different molecules, the reactant must either be traveling with a kinetic energy that is greater than most of the other molecules in the sample, or it must collide with the edge of the container. For unimolecular reactions, the rate is proportional to the concentration, since the more molecules there are, the more of them that will have the energy sufficient for the decomposition to occur. Most often, reactions will involve two molecules that collide with one another, whether they are the same type of molecule or two different types of molecules. In either case, this will be called a bimolecular reaction. These types of reactions could either be first order in A and first order in B, or second order in A, depending on the identity of the molecules involved. Some transformations involve elementary steps that are bimolecular in nature, and some overall chemical reactions involve a single step that is bimolecular, like these two examples, one with two different molecules, one with two molecules of the same type. While bimolecular reactions are the most common, there are reactions that we would define as termolecular, meaning three different molecules must collide at the same time in order for the reaction to occur. This kind of reaction is uncommon because the probability of three specific molecules colliding simultaneously is much less than for two, by a factor of a thousand, in fact. Nevertheless, these types of reactions exist, such as the one where two molecules of nitrogen monoxide react with one molecule of oxygen to produce two molecules of nitrogen dioxide. We should also note that these elementary steps that make up the reaction mechanism will typically vary greatly in their rates, and there will usually be one elementary reaction that is the slowest by a significant factor. This is called the rate-determining step. This is the step that limits the rate at which the overall reaction can occur. What can the rate determining step tell us about the rate law? Well, we know that the rate law for some chemical reaction, like this one here, cannot be found using the stoichiometry of the overall reaction. These exponents must be determined experimentally. But if we have the reaction mechanism, things are a little different. The exponents in the rate law can be determined by looking at the stoichiometry of the rate determining step from the reaction mechanism.
For example, when nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide react to form carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide, the rate law is found to be first order in each reactant when the temperature is above 225 degrees. However, at lower temperatures, the rate law shows a second order reaction with respect to NO2 and zero order in CO. This is not consistent with a single step bimolecular reaction as is shown in the overall chemical reaction. Instead, a mechanism like this makes more sense. As we can see, the first step is the rate determining step, and the rate law we could derive from the stoichiometry of this elementary reaction will match the rate law for the overall reaction below a certain temperature. Whenever the rate determining step is the first step in a reaction mechanism, the rate law for the overall reaction will simply be the rate law for this step, and this will often be the case for multi-step reaction mechanisms. So reaction mechanisms are useful not just to give us a clearer picture of what is happening on the molecular level, but also because a rate law can be derived directly from the stoichiometry of the rate determining step without gathering any experimental data. Professor Dave Furchegg, see you next time.